Hello and welcome to this channel. My name is Victoria and in this video we will talk about pediatric feeding, as breastfeeding and formula feeding and the important points of proper nutrition in childhood. First we will talk about the nutrition of the infant, so children up to one year of age. The WHO recommends that children up to six months are exclusively breastfed and with the supplementation and introduction of semi-solid and solid foods up to one year of age. There are of course cases where this is not possible. We will talk about those also. But why breast milk? The breast milk is species specific, meaning it is adjusted for the needs of the infant in its nutrition, digestibility, calorie, fat, protein and mineral components, as well as the biological needs of the child. Breast milk and animal milks differ in many of their components. Did you know, by the way, that the milk of the camel is the one that is in its components the closest to breast milk? Enough fun facts. Let's compare the different components of breast milk with animal milk. The protein amount in breast milk is relatively low, with 1-2% to and is in its chemical structure easy to digest. Animal milk has a much higher protein content and is more difficult to, di to digest for the human baby. The fat amount is relatively high and has enough essential fatty acids for the needs of the child and also contains the enzyme lipase which helps in its digestion. Animal milk does not have this enzyme and also lacks essential fatty acids. The human milk is high in water and provides the baby with enough fluids, while animal milk has a lower water content, so supplementation would be necessary. Breast milk is low in sodium, calcium and potassium, so it does not promote the development of kidney stones. Human milk also contains antibodies that protect the baby from infections, the animal milk does not contain them. Some of the antibodies and anti-inflammatory components include lysozymes that degrade the walls of the bacteria, lactoferrin which decreases the growth of iron-dependent bacteria, anti-staphylococcal factor, anti-adherents which inhibit the attachment of bacteria to the GI wall, interferons, antiviral lipids, mucopolysaccharides and eicosanoids. It also contains specific immunoglobulins, so IgAs and IgGs, which protect the baby from certain infections until it can make its own immunoglobulins. Breast milk has a pH of around 5, which does not irritate the wall of the peritoneum. It also contains hormones and growth factors, as tyroxine and tyrotropine releasing hormone, that are responsible for the function of the thyroid gland, prolactin, somatotropin, adrenocorticotropic hormone, cortisol and endorphins. Also, if a baby is fed with animal milk instead of breast milk, it is much more likely to develop allergies and asthma bronchiale. If you want to know more about asthma bronchiale in children, you can see our video on that in the playlist of pediatrics. As indicated earlier, there are some contraindications to breastfeeding, either on the side of the baby or the side of the mother. On the side of the baby, metabolic diseases as galactosemia, phenylketonuria or maple syrup urine disease make it impossible for the baby to metabolize breast milk without potentially dangerous side effects. Other contraindications for the baby are if the child has an intracerebral hemorrhage, acute respiratory or heart failure, extreme prematurity, malformations that can make latching or swallowing difficult, hyperbilirubinemia from breast milk, so breast milk jaundice, or allergic reactions. On the side of the mother, there are diseases but also other circumstances that are contraindications for breastfeeding. They include cystic fibrosis, tuberculosis, syphilis, tyrotoxicosis, treatment with radioisotopes or antimetabolites, herpes mastitis, HIV infection, 
hepatitis B or hepatitis C, and alcohol or other drug addictions. What if there are no contraindications to breastfeeding, but there is not enough breast milk being produced? This is called hypogalactia and is often related to irregular or insufficient timing of breastfeeding or inadequate amount and quality of the mother's diet, psychiatric trauma, or overexhaustion. Other factors for the cessation of milk production include social pressure of avoiding to breastfeed in public, at least in some cultures and settings. Indicators for hypogalactia are when the child does not gain enough weight, or the child is restless and agitated and demands more milk, more frequent than every two hours. Also indicators are how often the diaper of the baby is wet. The baby should, as we said, be exclusively breastfed for six months. In this time the milk changes in its components according to the baby's needs. The first two to three days of life, the breast milk is rather thick and high in protein. It is also high in sodium and antibodies, but lower in fat. This milk is called colostrum and is due to its carotenoid content yellowish in color. After the colostrum, for around 5 to 6 days, the milk changes towards the components of the mature milk. This milk is called transitional milk. If breastfeeding cannot be achieved or if there are other reasons for it not to be possible, formula should be introduced. Usually formula milk is avoided in the first month of life, instead donor milk can be considered. The regimen of feeding and quantity of food are almost the same as for breastfed children. Formula fed children are more likely to develop nutritional disorders as hypovitaminosis or obesity, infectious diseases as necrotizing enterocolitis, diarrhea, meningitis or otitis, allergic reactions, anemia, rickets, or later in life also arteriosclerosis, diabetes, leukemia, and asthma. Some advantages of formula include that it can be measured easily how much the baby drinks and the amount of energy it takes in. Nowadays formula milk also has a high similarity to breast milk and is sterile and chemically pure. It has a long shelf life, is easy to keep at home, and can be given to the baby by someone else than the mother. Formula milk is used usually enriched with macro and micro elements as iron, zinc and selen, also with nucleotides, long-chain unsaturated fatty acids, alpha nilonidic acid, prebiotics, taurine and probiotics. There are also certain formulas made specifically for children with metabolic diseases or hypoallergenic formulas. Now we will talk about the regimen of breastfeeding and the supplementations that are recommended for an infant to be added. In the first month of life, it is recommended for the child to receive milk on demand, so there is only a loose regimen. It is recommended to feed every 2 to 3 hours, so around 8 to 12 times daily, for around 5 to 20 minutes each. It is important to clean the skin around the breast before and after every feeding to avoid an infection of the newborn with bacteria from the skin. From the 21st day of life on, 400 international units of vitamin D should be given to the child. In the second month of life, the last evening feeding should be around 10 p.m. with a break of feeding of around 6 to 8 hours. At a six month of life, supplementation of the breast milk with semi-solid food is started by replacing one breastfeeding with a vegetable puree or porridge. It is important to introduce foods safely and slowly to ensure the baby's health and see how the baby reacts to certain foods. At this time, the baby should be able to chew, use the tongue to move the food, develop eye-hand coordination and demonstrate curiosity for different tastes. Raw foods, honey and nuts should not be given for at least the first year of life. Also cow milk, fish, 
eggs, citrus fruits, cheese, salt, sugar and honey are not given up to the sixth month. If the introduction of fruits is started before the sixth month, anemia, hypotrophy and rickets can possibly develop. If it is started four to six months later, it can lead to allergies and obesity. At the seventh month, the baby should be fed five times with 3.5 hour intervals in between each feeding. Every second day, blended meat and vegetable puree can be offered as well as fruit puree. At the eighth month, 50 ml of broth, finely chopped fruits and small quantities of animal milk can be offered as well as half a hard boiled egg yolk. At the 10th to 12th month, feeding occurs four times daily in four hour intervals and feeding with a, sh with a spoon should be begun. At this time also fermented dairy products as yogurt and cheese can be added. Now we will talk about nutrition between the first and third year of life, so in preschool children. The energy needs of the child are dependent on the growth, development and physical activity of the child. Nutrition should be diverse and offered in different forms and ways of preparation and the caloric intake should be sufficient. In the first year of life, a child needs around 800 calories. In the sixth year of life, double as much, around 1600 calories. And in the tenth year of life, around 2000 calories daily. The carbohydrate ratio should be like for adults, around 45-65% to 65 of the total energy in a day and the fiber intake should increase with age. It can be calculated by taking the number of years plus 5 gram as the daily recommended fiber intake. Fats should make up 30-40% to 40 of the daily energy in the first 3 years of life and for the rest of the childhood around 25-35% to 35 of the total energy in a day. The protein needs of the child decrease slowly with age. In the first three years, it should be around 1.1 gram per kilo per day or 5 to 20% of the total energy. In the fourth to eighth year, around 0.95 gram per kilo per day or 10 to 30% of the total energy. After the first year, two to three cups of formula should be given up to the second year. Excess milk feeding can lead to anemia and a child should learn to drink from a cup rather than a bottle and should start to feed independently with its hands. Avoided should be ovary sugary desserts, soft drinks and foods that can lead to choking as chewing gum, hard candy, peanuts or whole grapes. The weight and height of a child should be checked regularly by a pediatrician to ensure proper nutrition. There are different ways of evaluating the height. It is usually plotted into a weight chart specific for age and gender of the child. The mean weight should not be outside of two standard deviations or not below or above the 3rd to 97th percentile. The BMI can also be considered and should be between 19 and 25 for a healthy child. The same methods are applicable for the height. If you want to know more about short stature in children, you can see our video on that as well. Thank you for watching this video, I hope it was helpful and if you like our channel, please comment, like and subscribe. Thank you very much and hopefully see you again in the next video.